Mike Gill. Liberty Mutual exposed to... I'm going to take you through how Liberty Mutual corrupts your court system boldly and control your judges and your largest law firms. You don't believe it? Well, I'm going to show you. You will see a Morris Mahoney fee agreement. A fee agreement is where they agree to represent you and say that there are no conflicts except for this fee agreement was saying they had no conflicts with Liberty Mutual. Liberty Mutual is only their biggest client. See? So you see the date on that fee agreement. Then I want you to look at the Superior Court case that Morris Mahoney defended Liberty Mutual. You will see it's during the same time period. And a partner of Morris Mahoney represented that case, just as the partner of Morris Mahoney, Nick Alexander, along with Renner, represented me. You're going to see a deposition later on of Eric Renner pretending he knows nothing about Liberty Mutual. Remember, again, it's their biggest client. You're also going to see attached multiple profiles, again from Morris Mahoney lawyers, that they're bragging the fact that they save money for Liberty Mutual. So once again, what you're seeing is absolute proof of corruption. The corruption of Liberty Mutual, a major insurance company committing outright fraud to save money and corrupt the courtrooms. There's no question about this. You think after this is done that Attorney Renner isn't lying? Are you going to say to yourself that there are no conflicts? What you have to say to yourself is you realize that there is. And the question you should be asking yourself is, what the hell is going on? And I'm telling you, it's corruption. Who's paying for your defense? I already Judge answered. Asked and Ashton answered. I already answered. Morris and Mahoney's insurance company is paying for my defense. Okay. Do you know who's paying for Mr. Alexander's defense? To the best of my knowledge, Morris and Mahoney's insurance carrier. So Morris Mahoney is paying for all three parties' co- coverage. Objection. Objection. Object. Um, to your knowledge. Objection. No. Well, I think you just said that. I said Morrison's insurance company is paying for my defense. Very good. All right. So Morris Mahoney pays for the insurer who pays for your defense and Mr. Alexander's. And you see that as not a conflict. Is that correct? Objection. A conflict for who? You don't see it as a conflict. That's, that Objection. wasn't my answer. I'm, I'm asking. I don't. You're asking. I'm asking you. The fact that Morris Mahoney is paying for your defense and Mr. Alexander's defense, along with their own, their insurance carrier, do you find that a conflict? Objection. Objection. A conflict for whom? Well, Morris Mahoney is a separate entity, as you are. They're technically paying your defense. Objection. Through their insurance. Objection. I'm asking you. Objection. That's not a conflict. Objection. Objection. I don't agree with the premise of your question. At Morrison, there were instances in which I represented insureds of insurance companies who were clients of Morrison. And who were they? The insurance companies? Yes. I'll have to think. Liberty International, did you ever do work with them? I'm not aware. I, I don't. I'm not aware of any such entity. No, well, n- no. Uh, I, so the answer is no. No, not to my knowledge. So you might have done work for Liberty International. Objection. 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 I'm not familiar with a company called Liberty International, and I have no recollection of doing work for a company called Liberty International, if in fact one exists. How about you, Liberty Mutual? Any work with Liberty Mutual? Not to my knowledge. But you might have. Objection. Objection. My testimony is I don't believe I ever performed work for Liberty Mutual or one of its insureds. Not to my knowledge. It's a very simple question. You're saying you didn't have a conflict. Is that correct? Uh, No, I do not believe I had a conflict. And the people we were suing and the insurers that represented them, you never 
represented. Otherwise, that would be a conflict. Objection. 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 I'm not going to opine on what potentially may or may not have been a conflict of interest under your hypothetical scenario. Well, we're not sure if it's hypothetical because I'm trying to get you to answer the question to turn around and say, of the multiple insurers that, that the parties had, had you done business with any of them? Check to look at the I have no knowledge of who the other uh, defendants or potential defendants insurance carriers were. I had no knowledge of that. But you would agree the first thing is that you do a conflict check for yourself and Morris Mahoney. Objection. Objection. If Morris Mahoney done business with those insurers, would that be, and defended those insurers, wouldn't that be a conflict? Objection. Objection. I have no, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Well, it's a simple question. If Morris Mahoney did insurance defense work with some of the insurers that represented the defendants in our case, wouldn't that be a conflict that Morris Mahoney had? Objection. Objection. I don't believe so. I mean, your, your, your question is a hypothetical question. No, I, no, no, no. I, don't, I can't perform a conflict analysis based on a uh, hypothetical well, uh, limited set of facts. Check the interruption. We are saying that a conflict were checked because it's, it's standard with any new client. Is that correct? Objection. Um, it is what you've already testified yes, to. Yes, a conflict check is a standard procedure. Standard procedure. And one was done. Uh, it's, yes, to my knowledge. Yes, it was. Well, you wouldn't have been working on the case unless you were cleared for conflicts. Isn't that correct? Objection. Um, yeah, if... if if uh, a conflict check came back showing that there was a conflict, yes, I would not have performed. And work to on your it. knowledge, if there was a check conflict, to the interruptions. So, and to your <coughs> knowledge, there was a conflict. Then you would understand that would be a misrepresentation if it wasn't the conflict didn't come forward. Objection. Objection. Which is why we have conflicts, isn't that so? Objection. Objection. There's a, there's a couple of different questions there, and I don't know which well, one you'll Well, you've answer. already answered that your understanding of conflict. This would meet that interpretation. So the Check to Mr. Gill's agreement procedure. states November 23rd. You started working, and I started paying the bill in August. Objection. Isn't that so? Objection. Uh, yes. It is so. Well, no, strike that. I don't know when you paid. Excuse me? I do not know when you paid first. I, I know uh, from what you've represented to me, the bills reflect that I started working in August, yes. Okay, so we can agree that you started work on my case prior to the fee agreement being signed. Is that so? Yes. And potentially, that's improper. Objection. Objection. I'm using Mr. Renner's word. Check no. the characterization no. of the testimony. So it's so you're saying that if Morris Mahoney, yourself and Nick Alexander, didn't have me sign a fee agreement to November twenty third, the work prior to that was was perfectly fine. Objection. It was no breach of it was no unethical. Not, not just a form. I don't believe so, no. Have you ever worked for a client? Have you ever taken a client on, for instance, in your new company and done work without having a fee agreement signed? Objection. I have not. Uh, I was, as I was researching the issue, uh, I came to the belief that it was possible that a RICO claim, uh, assuming other predicate elements were satisfied, that the sending of invoices through the Postal Service could satisfy uh, the, um, the violation of, of a federal law, uh, this being the, the wire fraud Correct. statute. It's an email from September 2nd.
Nick Alexander, to you, Mr. Renner. The instructions are the first three things we need in MI, MSI case is are the following. Number one, do you recall this email? This was again September 2nd. Appears to be Nick's directions to you what has to get done in the order it has to get done. Do you have a copy of that? No. No. Why don't you mark it? Give it to him. Would you like to have Mr. Rana look at that while I go over Do it? Do you with want him? it marked first, Mr. Gill? Mr. Renner, does it look like these are instructions that Mr. Alexander are giving you on things to do? I'll mention the subject. It says to-do list. Um, yes, this looks like it was. A, okay. Would you like to testify for me, Mr. Gill, or could I answer? <laughs> Chronological events. Number one, what does that mean to you? Um, Nick requested that I develop a chronology of events. And what, what does that mean again? It means... Uh, These were your instructions. Would you explain to sir, me how sir, you read he them? He was in the middle of answering your question and you interrupted him. Please don't interrupt the witness when he's answering. A chronology of events means... Uh, a set of dates and events, uh, presumably starting uh, at the outset and moving forward, of uh, significant events that are relevant to uh, the claims that you were intending to pursue. So you read that, where you were going to research the claims. You were going to put it in a chronological order of how it all happened. Is that true? I w generally, yeah. Yes. Okay. And that was number one. Isn't that so? Uh, <laughs> so it might even apply to be the first thing you would do. Objection. It's, I don't read from this email that it's in any sort of uh, order of importance. So number one might mean something else. <laughs> Objection. Okay. So you would investigate and collect the information on being my attorney to put the case together. That would make sense, wouldn't it, Mr. Renner? Objection. Objection. I mean, did you define the case? I'm not really sure what you're referring to. Well, the cases you were representing me in. Wouldn't be a need to represent, investigate any other cases, would there? Objection. Uh, no, they obviously all concerned uh, you okay. or your company. So how did you go about now this, we, so we started this in September 2nd. Again, we didn't file the claims, or you didn't file the claims at all, but I was forced to file the claims sometime in what, the end of May? That seem accurate? Objection. Uh, May 2012, yes. So approximately 10 months again. Objection. Now, what was the process what was the information that you gathered to create that chronicle, chronology? The process was that I uh, generally reviewed the uh, documents and materials you provided to us. Uh, at some point, I spoke extensively, uh, as did Nick, uh, with either you or uh, your uh, uh, final divorce attorney, Bob Jutris, or uh, Marisa Pizzuto, or Henry Heider, um, to obtain uh, relevant facts. Um, we also obtained emails from Divine Millimit, um, used those in investigating the relevant facts. That was the process. And you did all that in September? Or you started the process clearly in September, right? Objection. Objection. Uh, yeah, presumably we started in September. So you've had many meetings with Henry Hyder. Objection. I don't agree with Objection. that. 
So if we produced Henry Hyder's bills and had you on it two, three times a day, many days, would that be a misrepresentation? Objection. I, I, I don't recall meeting with Mr. Hyder two or three times a day. I didn't say two, three times a day. You could have called, you could have emailed, but had communications and or meetings with Mr. Hyder numerous times. Objection. I mean, yes, we spoke to Mr. Hyder, uh, not infrequently, um, and met with him on I don't know how many occasions, spoke on the phone, corresponded by email, presumably. Mr. Juicerus, a number of times, where you actually went to his office. Yes. Actually, many times, wouldn't you say? Objection. Uh, there was several, yes, yeah, several times. Which is in the same town that my office is in, by the way. Well. <laughs> Objection. Is that a question? Yeah. Well, it isn't a question. Yeah, it is a question. No. It's a statement. You can ask a question, Why did please. we have to spend all this money to go to Boston instead of Haverhill, where you've been to Haverhill many, many times? Objection. Objection. There's no question there. So, would you agree that Maria Presuto helped you with this chronicle? Is that the same person as Marissa Presuto? Yes. Would you agree that she helped you with this chronicle? Uh, she, yes, she provided information. Quite a bit of information. In fact, would you call her your biggest source of information? No. Who gave you more assistance and more information than she did? Uh, either Mr. Jutris or you. Mr. Jutris gave you more than Mrs. Pursu Ms. Pursuto gave you? Uh, we were, uh Yeah, I mean, on most of these occasions, it was um, uh, Marisa and Mr. Jutris. Uh, on, uh, you know, on uh, other occasions, it would be one or the other. When we met, and I've come to Morris Mahoney, wasn't it always with Maria Pursuto? With me? Marisa Pursuto essentially was a conduit from whom information from you t to her to us was passed. The question was, when I went to your office, when we had meetings, wasn't each and every time Maria Pursuto was with me? Objection. Objection. I can't say each and every, uh, primarily she was, yes. Yes, yes. Was Mr. Jutras ever with me in a meeting that we had at Morris Mahoney? As Ms. Pursuto was with me each and every time was it the fact that Mr. Jutras never came with me? Uh, no, he never came to Morris Mahoney. Okay, so I f you still believe that most of the information came from Bob Jutras in regards to our attorneys? Objection. Objection. I mean, the, the documents we reviewed came from Mr. Jutras. So all of the... I mean, divorce documents. The divorce documents, those which we had access to, yes. Right. But the divorce documents was, we had Divine Millimat and CCR, so there was a number of other issues outside of the divorce. And Mr. Jutras was only on the divorce piece. Isn't that so? Um, no. He had access to all those. I those issues were all uh, relevant to your divorce. So was Mr. Jutras my divorce attorney? He was. And Mr. Jutras handled my divorce? He did. I'd like to submit this as evidence. This has just happened to be called a narrative or a chronolog chronology, which was number one. This is a narrative that Miss Miss Prosciutto. Let's do I want to tag that first. Yeah, nice. <coughs> supplied to you directly. The question of the instructions given to you. On this email was the chrono chronology of the events. Exhibit six is exactly that. Isn't that correct? Objection. Objection. Exhibit six is a chronology. Can you be more exact when you receive this? Objection. As I indicated, my best recollection is that Marisa provided this chronology 
uh, to me or Nick in roughly April of 2012, or perhaps March 2012, that time frame. So you're saying she only gave this to you like in August of 12? Objection. Objection. Is that what your testimony is? Objection. That is not my testimony. You did receive this narrative, Exhibit 6. I did. When do you remember reading it? I remember reading and receiving this chronology in approximately March or April of 2012. Yeah, if we go back, have we used this as an exhibit? What is it? The chronology of events, one, two, three. Can you go back to that? So this email is dated September 2nd. For the record, we're referring to Exhibit 5. And you're telling me that you didn't receive this for seven months? <coughs> My testimony, again, is that I recall receiving this chronology provided by Marisa Pizzuto in approximately March or April of 2012. Yeah, exhibit 5 that you refer to from September of 2011, the two are not related. Well, well number, question number, well, task number one, back on September 2nd, the to-do list, the person that would have had the narrative and put it together for you You didn't get for another seven months. So how did you in September perform the tax of the chronology? Where was your task in September? So my question is, what did you have in the next seven months? Objection. Objection. Let me attempt to answer your question as best I can. First of all, in September of 2011, to my recollection, I had not met or heard of Marisa Pizzuto. I don't know, recall when I first became aware of her. You are sure about that? I'm not sure about that. Oh. It's wait. possible. I don't know. Well, that's not what you testified to. You just said, I did not. When we referenced a bill, you're now saying, I don't know. Uh, object, so, objection. Would you like to start again and simply say, well, well, I'd like to straight, when did you start speaking to Marisa regarding this case and seeing that she was the one who put the chronology together and that was number one, it would be a natural to assume that you guys spoke about this. Now, I'm asking you, when did it start? Objection. 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 Again, I'm going to try my best to answer your question. I do not recall when I first uh, met or spoke with Marisa Pizzuto. So if I said August, or if I said September, would you disagree with that? Objection. Objection. It's possible. I don't recall. It's possible. So for instance, then let's go back to September. T turns out it's very possible. In fact, you did. According to Morris Mahoneyville, you charged me for speaking to her, regarding the chronologic. So I submit this as evidence. Isn't it so? Then you would have had all this information maybe as early as September. No. No? No. So she, well, you didn't remember before. Are you saying? For absolute certainty, she didn't give you this information in September. Objection. Objection. Uh, yes, I am saying that. October. Uh, yes. I, I, I already testified, Mr. Gill, that my recollection <coughs> is that I received this chronology from Ms. Pizzuto in approximately March or April of 2012. Was that not? And is that not 
the basis of the complaint. In fact, if you were read the narrative, would you say that it reads extraordinarily similar with its charges and accusations than the complaints that were drawn up? Um, I, I can't answer that question. I, I haven't, I'd have to compare the two documents. You did read this narrative. Not today. I, at the time, when I received it, I read it. So you did. So did you write the complaints yourself? I physically typed it onto a computer based on information provided by you, Mr. Jutras, Ms. Pizzuto, Mr. Heider, and perhaps other of your attorneys. So, so you didn't write it, you typed it. Is that your testimony? Uh, yes. So you're a typist. I would not call myself a typist. Well, while you were typing it out, what did you use for evidence? Did you use this narrative? I'm sure I would have. So you did. So are you telling me that whatever was on this narrative, whatever was put in this, the complaints, you didn't have any input or formulate any of that outside of typing it. Is that your testimony? That Objection. is not. Objection. Objection. That is not my testimony. Did you write the complaints? I, yes, Objection. I typed the complaint based on, uh, you know, months of uh, factual and legal investigation into your potential claims based on document reviews, Speaking with uh, you, your other attorneys, Ms. Pizzuto, uh, Darla Sedgwick, speaking with uh, Nick, uh, I mean, <laughs> I typed the complaint based on our complete factual analysis. And, I, and that's what you would do to put a complaint together, is to go through the pains and efforts and the analysis that you just spoke about. So you were the one as my attorney, that did all this analysis. You gathered all this information and put it in a complaint. Is that correct? Objection. I was not the only one who did that. I didn't ask you that. I said you were one of the people who put this complaint together. Yes, I was one of, uh, one of the individuals who did that. So, well, did anyone else type it? physically type it? No, not to my knowledge. So you were the one who typed it. So in putting all this together, did you have any help in putting it together or did someone, for instance, like Nick review it thereafter? Uh, yes, Nick reviewed it afterwards. So you could say you were the author of the complaint. I was an author of the complaint. Who was the other author? I mean, you're going to have to define what you mean by authoring. I physically typed the words into the, comp the, uh, the complaint itself. Yes, I physically typed it based on uh, discussions and reviews of documents. And cons and were you my attorney? Yes. So you were representing me? I was. And you were the one who gathered this information to be factual and, and use this narrative to put it in this complaint. Are you not representing that complaint as your efforts and work in the investigation of this and as the as representing me as my attorney and not just a typist? Objection. Objection. My, my testimony is that I, yes, I, as your attorney, I prepared the complaint my point is, I was not the only attorney or individual who uh, had input into the allegations contained in the complaint. My testimony is that Ms. Pizzuto provided this chronology and we considered it and took the information she provided and utilized uh, the chronology uh, in conjunction with the rest of our fact-finding efforts and formulated the uh, complaint. So you used it, this information that she gave you, to put in the complaint? 
the it right, is exhibit yeah. six, please. It's exhibit six. Yes. Thank you. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I, okay. I considered it. I would like you to read out loud, please, the, the second part of that narrative that Ms. Pursuto also authored. What are you asking this gentleman to do, Mr. Renner? I'll read that document, please. You want Mr. Renner? Yes. Let me finish, please. To read a document that I think you intended to have marked as Exhibit 8, but I'm not sure since it has not yet been marked. Let's, why don't we track that? Do you want it marked? Yes. Let's mark it, and then I'll, I'll make my comment. It is marked. Exhibit it is 8 here. is marked? It is here. Well, I'll note that this document that's been marked has handwriting in the upper right-hand corner that does not appear on any of the, the, the copies provided to Council, but notwithstanding the same. You're asking this gentleman to read, in, to the record, ten pages of an exhibit you've already marked to this deposition. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. You understand that there are time limits, to, that time limits to your ability to examine this witness, and you want him to spend the time necessary to read ten pages into the uh, into the record. Yes. Okay. I, I object to the representations that have been made about the authorship of the uh, exhibit A. She been brought in as a witness or put in as an affidavit, but we have, have established her as a uh, as someone we use for input. And I also say, and want this on the record, that it mirrors almost exactly the complaint that Mr. Renner authored. So, what mirrors? Objection. Ms. Prezzuto's narrative and chronology of what went on. Objection. If you want this witness to read 10 pages, we'll allow him to do so. Morrison Mahoney as Malpractice Counsel. Backstory. The initial introduction to Nick Alexander Slowly. came through Rob Fitzgerald of the Lorenzi Group, Perens, originally hired in the divorce case to be an expert witness with regard to computer hard drives, close Perens, in the summer of 2011. Rob F. had originally been hired by Jonathan Ross, Perens, formerly of the now defunct Wigan and Norrie, close parens, as a computer expert to testify in my divorce. When Mike Gill eventually hired Bob Jutras, we were still engaging Rob's services. Rob and his company do a great deal of work with the New Hampshire legal community as legal experts with regard to computer forensics. In July 2011, Rob F. had a strange reaction to attorney Bob Jutras as new divorce counsel and attorney Marisa Pizzuto, who Bob hired to help with my case as to the children's issues. With Bob only having been in the case for approximately two to three weeks and digesting the previous four years of litigation from nearly 35 bankers' boxes, Perens, disheveled and completely unorganized files of all previous divorce counsel in the case, case close parens, Rob F. literally went over the top wild yelling at Bob that he wasn't serving his client because he was not addressing the evident unethical and sleazy behavior of opposing counsel in the case. Of course, this would seem to be the right thing to be saying if one was highly concerned for Mike Gill. Rob F. proceeded to accuse Attorney Jutras of failing to have opposing counsel arrested because his client had been in contempt of an order in the case. That is where Rob lost credibility since he was so outraged about something that didn't make sense. He kept saying he had seen this done many times before and that attorney, attorney Jutras was committing malpractice not to have opposing counsel arrested. 
This was so ridiculous and distracting to the case that Marisa Pizzuto sat Mike Gill down and respectfully requested that he speak to Rob and inform him, him that he really didn't have proper understanding of the procedures in such a case and that having opposing counsel arrested for their client's alleged contempt actions was actually not possible. Shortly thereafter, Rob F. calmed down and offered instead to help in connecting with a good Boston malpractice firm. He raved about Nick Alexander at Morrison Mahoney and how he had witnessed him do these th kinds of malpractice cases before and that he thought Nick was great. In or about August of 2011, Mike Gill did meet with Nick in Boston and went ahead with hiring him and the prominent firm of Morrison Mahoney. An attorney-client fee agreement was signed and reta retainer paid to Morris and Mahoney. Nick offered Mike an apparent deal he couldn't refuse, $200 per hour and 10% of the case. Uh, bracket, it is noteworthy that Nick is in the technology litigation department at Morrison and has never done malpractice litigation, which he only told Mike in May of 2012. The firm represents on their website that they have a professional malpractice department within the firm. Attorney Alexander is not in that department. Close bracket. Wigan and Nori and Jonathan Ross, Mike's previous divorce attorneys, were suing Mike for $100,000, and that opened the door for the first of the malpractice suits, and this was the starting point for Nick and Eric in or about September 2011. What Bob and Marisa did not know is that simultaneously, Rob F. was steering Mike to another divorce attorney. However, Mike declined to interview the divorce attorney. Rob called Mike to encourage him to reconsider this Boston divorce attorney who was willing to only charge $200 per hour. Mike declined as he was satisfied that attorney Jutras was honest and had begun the work in the proper way. Thereafter, Rob F. seemed to perform as you would expect an expert witness to perform his services, and he and Bob seemed to get along fine. No issues were ever raised by Rob F. again. This was another professional in my case and paid me, but not working, and paid by me, but not working in my interest. Bracket. Uh, question. Why would Rob Fitzgerald advocate so zealously for Mike Gill to sue the very law firms that his company, the Lorenzi Group, is often hired by. Their own business does a high volume of work with the New Hampshire law firms involved. Close bracket. Uh, bracket. FYI, Alex Walker had also attempted to dissuade me from hiring Bob Jutras. It was known that Bob was honest and couldn't be controlled, and they didn't want outside eyes looking at the case. Close bracket. Nicholas Alexander and his associate, Eric Renner, began their work in early September. Generally, their posture in each discussion was to minimize many of the claims as too difficult to prove. Mike Gill then asked Marisa Pizzuto to help transition the case, which would save time and money as she had already helped organize the 35 or so boxes of files and helped prepare the divorce case. There was a sealing order that was in effect in the family court, and the plan was for Marisa to focus on transitioning primarily the facts and documents relating to the legal matters handled by Alexander Walker and Divine, Millimet, and Branch, and other matters unrelated to the divorce proceedings. The issues with Alex Walker and DM were a large portion of the issues as Alex Walker had really quarterbacked all of my legal matters, both corporate and personal, since 2002. Right off the bat, we had an issue of finding New Hampshire counsel to be a placeholder in the New Hampshire court, since Nick and Eric were not licensed in New Hampshire. Morrison Mahoney employs literally hundreds of attorneys, and not one of them could represent Mike in the New Hampshire courts. The Morrison Mahoney website shows many, many of their attorneys with New Hampshire licenses. 
Nick told us the three lawyers in their Manchester, New Hampshire office all had conflicts with Wigan and Norrie. He implied they had worked directly with John Ross, although it wasn't clear what these relationships were. Wigan and Norrie had been around for about 100 years as a domestic relations firm. All three of the Morris and Mahoney lawyers in Manchester do some kind of insurance and or commercial litigation. The Morrison Mahoney website doesn't mention any previous careers at Wigan and Norrie or domestic relations practice. We end up having Henry Hyder be the placeholder for Morrison Mahoney in the malpractice countersuit. Henry had been representing MSI in some employee related litigation. Henry Hyder admitted to Mike Gill that Alex Walker approached him parens, via phone call. Close parens, right off the bat, upon knowing of his representation of Mike and MSI. Since that time, Henry has exhibited serious anxiety and expressed a flat-out refusal to represent Mike in any lawsuit against Alex Walker. Henry Hyder. There is an issue with having Henry in this case, or in the case, because Alex Walker got to Henry right away and intimidated him into playing on the opposing team. This was obvious right from the beginning of working with Henry. Henry told Mike Gill that Alex Walker called him as soon as he was aware Henry was working with me. Thereafter, Henry acted very nervous and has been sporadically absent from the case and then reappears only to call with probing questions to Mike. Marisa and Bob. Nick never would entertain my concerns with regard to getting Henry out of the case. Even John Friedman had offered to make the connection to an attorney in his office who was licensed in New Hampshire. Marisa Pizzuto and Mike Gill made several requests by email and in person that Nick contact John Friedman for many reasons, including the New Hampshire Council issue. He ignored these requests and found no other options despite his obvious ability and resource to do so. Whenever Mike raised concerns about Henry's true position, Nick would convince him there was no issue with Henry. This situation felt increasingly strange as time went on. Henry remained absent from the case for long periods of time, and at one point demanded that Mike sign a release for him as to any potential allegation of conflict of interest for representing MSI, parens, in the position which Alex Walker represented me for years and never raised any concern about conflict of interest where my ex-wife had been partial owner of the corporation. Close parens. Neither Henry Hyder nor Nicholas Alexander ever mentioned that there had been requests and communications with counsel for Divine, Millament, and Branch as early as September or October 2011. Mike Gill never found out they had been in communication until approximately April 2012. Mike was not copied on any of the written communications. They had, in fact, upon an oral request, received all uh, if DM and B internal emails since 2002 without any formal request or complaint being filed. Mike Gill had made several requests himself and through Marisa to have Nick speak directly with John Friedman as John had represented MSI in front of the Massachusetts Banking Department and certainly had very relevant and important information and perspective. Nick simply would not make the call. When the news came out about John being appointment to the Massachusetts Board of Bar Overseers, we shared this information with Nick, thinking surely this would prompt him to understand how valuable John could be to this case. Still no contact. Finally, Mike was strenuously requesting that everyone that was on his team sit down at one table and pull together a strategy. It was beginning to feel too much like Nick was being a cowboy and that things were being stalled. Mike requested such a meeting to include John Friedman, Bob Jutras, Marisa Pizzuto, with Nick and Eric. Nick called Marisa to say that he would probably meet with John alone. No explanation or rationale given. 
Nick finally did, in fact, reach out to John. Nick and Eric met then with Marisa and Mike. In fact, any communication with John was always done specifically without Mike or Marisa present. Nick would not allow John to even be conferenced in on calls we had. Nick and John have never actually shared any information about any of the conversations they have had with me. In retrospect, we have compared with John some of the information Nick relayed about their conversations, and it appears he was manipulating the information between me and John. As Mike continued to grow more impatient with the time that was passing, a few interesting things happened. One, star witness Darla Sedgwick was an associate working on my case at Wigan and Norrie and was named as a defendant <coughs> in the counterclaim malpractice suit against Wigan and Norrie is interviewed by Nick and Eric back in November 2011. Parens. Darla was let go from Wigan and Norrie at the time Mike fired the firm and she moved to Oklahoma. Close parens. It was a very strange day that started out as marked for deposition and turned into an interview. Darla seemingly gave some very helpful information to us that day. However, she left without signing any kind of statement or affidavit. There was a whole orchestration put on in which she dramatically fires her attorney, who appears not to be representing her interests that day. But he doesn't leave and continued to sit in the interview. Nick acted shocked and appalled at the situation. End result is that after all the drama, Darla leaves for Oklahoma not having been deposed and not having signed a single statement. Two, Nick repeatedly told Mike Gill that the management at his firm does not want him to work on his case. He told Mike that, however, he is just so devoted to him as a client, he is prepared to leave Morrison after 21 years and go to another firm and take my case. He emphasized that finding the right firm might take some time and he was in the process of looking, etc. This went on for months and continued right up until the present. He just kept saying it would take more time, a few more weeks. Nick told Mike that he had engaged the services of a public relations firm, Thompson Communications in Middleton, Massachusetts, to help manage our media campaign. Funny thing is that Morris Mahoney was willing to do the contract directly with Thompson, but would not sign the malpractice complaint. When Mike arrived for the first meeting, Perens, Nick, Eric, Marisa, Thompson, and me, close parens. Nick first met alone with Dave Thompson and then brought us all in the room. Again, Mike Gill was never told what was in the conversation with Thompson. This was the pattern. Four. After this meeting, Marisa received a call from Nick in which he literally yelled at her about our inability to sue the NHBD because MSI had been in violation of some regulations in 2008 and that John Friedman told him about these violations and that this would prevent us going after the banking department. He was yelling at her for not vetting those facts. Funny thing is that she had provided a narrative of the facts which included information about the 2008 violations to Nick and Eric about a month previously. Further, Nick was told these facts verbally by Mike and Marisa, so his accusation that she had not vetted these facts and that John had stated uh, that we could not go after the NHBD was very odd and was an attempt to intimidate her. Nick was further telling Marisa that she shouldn't believe everything Mike is saying just because he is an intimidating salesman. Five. Marisa had found a NHBD consent order online earlier that same week, which proved that the star character in the Implode case, Brian Battersby, had been exonerated for NHBD violations a week or so after he testified in a deposition at Divine Millimet in the Implode case. Nick didn't react with enthusiasm to his finding to this finding, which is strange since it helped prove a motivation in Mike's case. 6. Nick 
had always said Mike would not get a fair trial in the state of New Hampshire and we needed a federal judge and the only remote chance was to get a RICO charge. Then Nick said that John specifically said not to sue the NHBD. John Friedman denied stating this to Nick. 7. Nick told Mike in approximately May 2012 that he is not actually a litigator and we will now have to actually hire another lawyer to litigate the case. Mike fully believed he was hiring a litigator when I hired him and Eric from a prominent litigation firm. <coughs> All of the sudden, oh, eight, excuse me. All of the sudden, at the beginning of May, Eric becomes frantic to draft the complaint against the 21 defendants due to their concerns about the running of some of the statutes of limitations. They were forcefully targeting the, fi targeting the filing date as May 11. Despite Mike's repeated request, they flat out refused to include attorney Tara Schaff of Tober Law Offices. She played a major role in Mike's divorce case and particularly in the loss of my relationship with his only daughter, which has been the very most difficult part of this entire legal fiasco. Nine. The other issue about this complaint was that Nick was telling Mike that he would have to be filing pro se because of Nick's status at Morrison Mahoney and because he couldn't put their name on it and once he was settled at his new firm, he would sign on and there would be no issues. He claimed he was very concerned about the running of the statute of limitations and it just couldn't wait. Nick said for months he was leaving Morrison and he kept moving the date further out and this was a stall. Mike now doesn't believe Nick had any intentions of leaving the firm and taking Mike's case because he was just so devo devoted to the case. In fact, he now believes that due to a conflict of interest, parens, <coughs> Morrison Mahoney's sixth largest client is the insurance carrier for Divine Melamit, close parens, Nick was again stalling and running out the statute of limitations, which is already turning out to be the exact thing happening. Nick waited until Friday, May 11, to call John Friedman to see if his firm could sign the pleadings in the interim until he could step into the case. It was represented to John on the phone that Nick had already reached out to the parties to let them know that he would be signing on. Nick never indicated to Mike that he had made any contact whatsoever with any of the parties. After Mike fired Nick and became angry about the pro se filing, Nick told Marisa that none of the parties had any knowledge of the complaint, parens, not yet served, close parens, and that organizing a settlement meeting would be time consuming and he couldn't make it happen right away. Then he went on later to sign an affidavit for the family court in which he stated that he had told the parties in advance of his intention to sign on to the complaint after, Mike, after making Mike file pro se. 10. <clears throat> on May 10th, Eric forwarded a draft to Marisa and Mike. There was very apparently still a volume of work that was needed on this nearly 80-page document. Nick doesn't appear to have been supervising this drafting at all. Marisa took the initiative to set up a conference call to go over the document line by line to make sure the facts were correct, etc. <coughs> Eric made the statement to her that he really just wanted to get it filed on Friday to get it done. It was shocking that a firm of the caliber of Morrison Mahoney was willing to file a document in that condition and without review by the supervising attorney. 11. John Friedman was called the very day to sign the pleadings for documents he had never even read, and Morris Mahoney knew the fraud that had been committed and didn't want their name on it. Although Mike didn't receive an invoice for legal fees with the name of the firm on it for 43k, since catching Nick, he has repeatedly called Marisa to see what she knew about why Mike was upset with Nick and Eric. They were particularly interested in whether Mike was having financial problems. <coughs> the pleading was filed on May 14 in a very, very rushed fashion. 
Mike filed pro se, and Mike felt very uncomfortable about doing this, but felt intimidated that there may be statutes of limitations running and filed the documents under duress. Okay. i like to get a glass of water, if I can. Uh, as long as I get extra time. And I also want it on the record that Mr. Duggan gave us a little lecture about taking this time, and then he immediately asked Mr. Renner to talk slow. So we can safely say sometimes, I mean, when did you, when did I file the lawsuits? What month? Jackson. Uh, May. May. So at that point, because of the age of some of the lawsuits, not necessarily divine, but a number of the complaints within the, the complaint had issues because of the length of time it was. So you had concerns about statutes of limitations. Is that correct? Objection. Objection. My previous answer, with respect to certain of the defendants, out of an abundance of caution, we thought it was prudent to file the divine millimet complaint when we did, given our opinion that certain of those defendants uh, had potential statute of limitations defenses they could raise. Okay, so we've established you had that concern. Yet, when Ms. Prosciutto questioned you as early on May 10th and asked you very directly, are you concerned about the statute's limitations? Do you remember what your answer was? Uh, I do not. <coughs> well, we'll put this into record, but I'll read it to you. No, but I want to get it filed. So can I have that marked, please? So, why would you say that then? Well, excuse me, Kay. he doesn't have the exhibit. Yeah. <coughs> but could you read that first line, Mr. Renner? No, but I want to get it filed. Okay. Was the question not about statutes or limitations? And when Ms. Prosciutto questioned you in an email, on the same month we filed the lawsuits, you said to her, no. Now, why would you say that? Uh, her question posed in her May 10th email is, is tomorrow the absolute deadline considering the statute of limitations as to all the players? And that's, I, that's not true. It was not. Well, was that the <coughs> correct answer? She asked you if you had concerns about statute of limitations. You said no. Objection. Objection. Now, didn't you testify you, you did have concerns about the statute's limitations, in particularly in the month of May? Objection. Objection. My answer, my previous answer stands. What is that answer to? Her question to me is, is tomorrow the absolute deadline considering the statute of limitations as to all the players? The players, I presumably referring to the, all of the defendants. Right. So my answer to her is no. That it, that's, that's not the absolute deadline to the extent. She asked you if you were concerned. No, she did not. Of the deadline. No objection. That's not what it says. Well, we'll give you <coughs> another one. Ms. Prosciutto to Eric Renner, mm -hmm. looking at this now, is tomorrow the absolute deadline? SOL for all the players. <coughs> so you would have had to have a conversation, or she has to have a concern that we have a statute of limitation problems. I read it. We can have her sign an affidavit that says that she asked you if we had a problem with statutes of limitations. Has she ever asked you in the month of May, Eric, do we have a problem with statutes of limitations? Objection. 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 Mr. Gill, my, as I've previously stated, 
with respect to certain of the defendants in the divine militant complaint. Out of an abundance of caution, we thought it was wise to file the complaint when we did, given certain defendants had potential uh, statute of limitations defenses that they could raise. That r that's my answer. But we had other cases. <coughs> but three days, it gets kicked out. Your statement <laughs> is that you didn't have a concern or issue with the statute of limitations. Objection. Objection. Is that not a contradictory statement by saying no? Objection. When you clearly testified just minutes ago that you did have concerns. Objection. Objection. Um, you're mischaracterizing the email. I don't believe I have. I believe, as it turns out, that Ms. Pursuto's concern, and if you remember, let's go back to her narrative, didn't she spell out exactly those concerns? Didn't she say that she believed you were stalling to get past statutes of limitations? Could you read 6-6 six, six copy, number 13? By April of 2012, the management of my firm, Morrison Mahoney LLP, informed me that while no legal conflict of interest existed with this anticipated new complaint, the firm nonetheless did not want me to represent plaintiffs generally in legal malpractice actions since the firm defends lawyers against malpractice claims. So, what did we inform the court? What does that mean to you? Objection. Objection. It means exactly what it says. It means Morris Mahoney does not want to represent me <coughs> and notified the court that in April. Is that right? Objection. 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 It, and Nick is attesting to the fact that he was informed uh, by April of 2012 by uh, Morris and Mahoney, Morris and Mahoney's management, that they did not uh, want uh, him to uh, represent you in connection with the Divine Millimet complaint. <coughs> so we're notifying the court that I don't have representation, yet no one at any time in writing gave me that. In fact, I was still paying Morris Mahoney, I believe it was 43000 the month of April, to not represent me. Isn't that correct? Objection. Objection. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if that's correct or not. Well, let's see. We do have it in writing here. Is this affidavit correct, do you believe? As Objection. far as I know. So it does say <coughs> Mr. Alexander is making the representation mm -hmm. to the court that Morris Mahoney is not going to represent me. Objection. Isn't that Objection. right? Objection. Uh, no, that's not what it says. They said they didn't want Nick to represent you. Well, did they? Objection. Objection. When we filed the complaints, did Morris Mahoney or yourself or Nick Alexander resent, represent me? Uh, <coughs> we didn't sign the complaint, if that's what you're asking. Oh, so you <coughs> didn't sign the complaint, but you did represent me? Uh, we did represent you at that time, yes. You represented me for the purpose of filing these complaints in my defense, isn't that so? Objection. You were the plaintiff in this, in this, uh, in this case. What case? The Divine Millimet case. You were the plaintiff asserting claims against the various defendants. Right. So did you represent me in this matter? Objection. Uh, yes, we represented you. Um, M Morrison Mahoney, uh, his management, informed Nick that they didn't want Nick and uh, obviously myself as his associate to uh, sign on to the complaints under Morrison Mahoney's name. After 10 months of work that I paid for, <coughs> is that correct? Objection. Objection. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. Well, I mean, it's pretty clear. I paid you from August to May to represent me in a complaint from the very beginning that at the time of filing, with no notification to myself, 
Morris <coughs> Mahoney then refused to represent me in the cases. That's just a, isn't that the facts, Mr. Renner? Objection. 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 Um, I disagree that you weren't notified. Uh, my recollection is that uh, Nick informed you of his uh, disagreements with the firm prior to the time the complaint was filed. Um, I, I believe that was at some point in April. When he you have no recollection, Bob, what Mr. Alexander spoke to me. Objection. Were you, a, were you ever present when Mr. Alexander says, we can't represent you? Uh, yeah, there were numerous occasions where that fact was, had been communicated to you. So we have nothing in writing that from Morris Mahoney, yourself, or Mr. Alexander gave me in informing me that Morris Mahoney couldn't represent me. Objection. Objection. <coughs> wait, wait for a question, please. That is the question. The question is, do you have any recollection? Did you see an email? that said to me, I mean, because it's not out of line to think attorneys would put something of this nature in writing, wouldn't you think? Objection. 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 I, don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Well, they notified the court of that prior to notifying me. What you're seeing here was notifying the court in April, wasn't it? Doesn't that say April? Objection. This is an affidavit uh, submitted to the court in June. It refers to being April, though. Doesn't that say April? Objection. Yes, but you said... Oh, okay. But it does say April, now, doesn't it? Objection. Okay. Now, I want you to read the same paragraph on 619. By April of 2012, <coughs> the management of my firm, Morris Mahoney LLP, informed me that the firm did not want me to represent plaintiffs generally in legal malpractice actions since the firm defends lawyers against malpractice claims. Since the defense... Are they saying, is Nick saying, again, does it, <coughs> did, did he alter it, what he said in a matter of six days? Does, do you find an alteration in this Objection. statement? Objection. But uh, there is a difference in the language used, yes. There is. And when he submitted, it was June 6th. So we changed it in a matter of days. Isn't that so? Objection. I mean, the dates speak for themselves. Yes. So it's yeah. yes. Oh. What do you see the difference in? Now read the first one, one and then read the second one. The uh, first one exhibits... 15 refers to a legal conflict of interest, while the uh, paragraph in Exhibit 16 does not. Do you find that to be a, a substantial difference? Objection. Uh, objection. Um, a substantial. It's it's a it's different language. It is. He basically changes his affidavit, doesn't he? Objection. Objection. It is not the same. So that means he changed it. Objection. Have you heard of Mr. Driscoll? I believe that he is an yet another one of your former attorneys in this case. Do you know him? I do not. Well, that's the question I'm asking. Not if I said it. Do you know him? I do not. Have you heard any conversations about Mr. Driscoll? I mean, other than perhaps with my attorney, uh, no. So only your attorney if you've had that conversation with? Object. Is that right? Object. Objection. I've had, to my knowledge, that I've had... the substance of a privileged communication. Yeah, to my knowledge, I've oh, had no. no discussions with anyone uh, about the Mr. Driscoll. Francesca O'Reilly. Have you heard of her? I've never heard of that person. Jonathan Breen. Uh, I believe that's another one of your former attorneys in this case. I'm asking you again. Do you know him? I do not. Good. Neil Pike. I do not know that person.
Are you familiar with FRM? Uh, generally, yes. You are? How are you familiar with it? I came to learn of it in well, when we are representing you in your case. Who represented me? When you were representing me in my case, you're familiar with FRM. Yeah, I believe you brought it to our attention, and you saw some link between uh, the occurrences of uh, that, uh, of the FRM situation, and you saw some link between uh, you. With the protection of Divine Millimat. Didn't you, did you put that in any claim, or reference it? Objection. In the Divine Millimat case? Yes. Uh, I don't believe so. Did you reference it in any case? Um, I don't... Not to my knowledge. I mean, there are only two cases. There was this oh. one and the Wigan and Nori case. So what do you know about FRM? Did you researched it, right? Objection. I mean, generally, I know that it involved uh, uh, loans in the banking department of New Hampshire um, and some sort of Ponzi scheme. Did you read a book about it? I did. You did? Yeah. What was the name of the book? Um, cover Up? Right. Now, why did you read that book? Because y you saw some connection between that and your situation, and so I wanted to look into, into what FRM was. So it was a Ponzi scheme? Uh, I mean, generally, that's my recollection of, of what it involved, yeah. Isn't so that what the book said? I don't recall the book. I know I read the book. I don't recall. I know it was written by a guy who was uh, either with the Banking Commission or some some. Mark state. Conley, ring a bell? Uh, it's possible. That's his name. Right. That's the, reader, that's the author of the book. Okay. You know, dozens were sold. <laughs> and you got one. Now, isn't the FRM matter has something to do with the Banking Commission? Objection. Isn't that the accusation that the Banking Commissioner was corrupt? Objection. Um... I, I believe that's so, yes. So, yes. So the connection isn't just with Divine Millimat, which the Banking Commission. And isn't it so I have a banking license, a mortgage license? Objection. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you currently do or not. I, uh, you, you did. Didn't you have conversations with Mr. Hyder regarding the IRS? Um, I believe so, yes. Well, you were getting input from Mr. Hyder, right? Well... I don't know if it was the IRS <coughs> or the New Hampshire Department of Revenue. I'm not Wasn't sure. it both? Um, I see him talking to uh, you sir, about sir, both. Sir, would you like him to answer the question or not? It may be. I don't recall, sir. All right, so you don't recall. All right. But, in fact, Mr. Hyder was dealing with the IRS and the DRA. Do you remember what we said? What we had our issues with the IRS? Check to the statements. Do you remember? And speaking to Mr. Hyder about the concerns with the IRS. Objection. Who is we? Who are you referring you to? You and Mr. Hyder had conversations regarding his piece in representing me in the IRS and the DRA matters. Objection. You didn't have conversations with Mr. Hyder regarding the DRA and the IRS? Uh, I did. You did. Thank you. So. Was anything to do with forgery on a tax return? Mm. Not to my knowledge. We was discuss fraud when it came to the tax return. Uh, I, I don't recall that, no. So what do you recall the conversation with? Did I not have a problem with the IRS and the DRA? Objection. Uh, yes, you had matters pending. Oh, well, I don't know if the IRS... Uh, yes, you had IRS and DRA issues pending. Right. You wrote the complaint and highlighted the IRS matter. They spoke very clearly about it. Okay. Well, you wrote it. So, the issue was, we had a forged tax return. Was there a misrepresentation on the tax return? Isn't that what you charged CCR and Divine Melomet with? Objection. Objection. I don't understand. What are you referring to, sir? Well, you know what? I think it would help if you refer to the 
complaints. Would you? How about page 19 of the complaint? Which for the record is Exhibit 7. What? Which for the record is Exhibit 7. In case we're confused. Page 19, you said? Let's go to page 9. 9. Again, you wrote these complaints with the help of input Do you have any issues what was said here? Objection. Uh, objection. Meaning, he, the accusation was, is that we won with the IRS in regards to not calling it a hobby. Isn't that correct? Objection. You have written this in your complaint. Sir. In a divine millimat NCCR. Sir, objection, again, objection. this is your complaint, sir. These are allegations communicated to you. Your other attorneys uh, investigated as best I could to confirm. Uh, so the you accuracy. did investigate, sir, sir. Please let the witness finish his answer, please. Right. What is the question? Did you investigate the information, or did you just throw it on a complaint? I investigated with the information I had available to me. Yes. Good. You were the author of this complaint. I don't care all the research you did. You had 10 months to do all kinds of research. You have exact numbers on this complaint. You have exact accusations. Whether they be mine or Maurice's, you investigated. You've told me that you wouldn't put allegations on this that you didn't investigate, right? I, I mean, to, uh, I'm going to attempt to answer your question. Uh, I, as it, I wouldn't, in any case, file a complaint that I didn't have a good faith basis uh, for the factual and legal assertions being made. Mr. Renner, did you have any conversations with Nick about Nick taking these cases to the FBI? I wouldn't call them conversations. I recall you. I recall you raising that prospect either with Nick or with uh, Attorney Friedman um, and that you wanted to get the FBI involved somehow. Uh, that's generally what I recall. So you're suggesting that, that I made the assertions to Mr. Friedman and questioned him about the FBI and Mr. Alexander. Is that true? Jerkson. Again, I, I don't have a I have a I have a general recollection of discussions involving you and Nick and Mr. Uh, Friedman about um, about taking certain claims. I I, I think uh, related to the banking department and bringing that to the attention of the FBI or Me perhaps the. Maybe it was the U.S. Attorney's Office? Uh, I, I or both. Perhaps. So you can recall conversations necessarily with Mr. Alexander about the FBI and going to them? No. I recall generally that that prospect, at some point, you uh, raised that idea. So I raised the idea, to your knowledge? Uh, to my knowledge. Not Nick Alexander? Um, I, I don't know how it came up. I don't know. My, my, as I sit here today, my best recollection is it was your idea, but I, I don't, I don't know. But you, if you don't know, why were you suggesting that I brought it up? Objection. Um, well, for starters, it's based on your comment earlier today that you intend to bring uh, forward the transcript of this deposition to the FBI uh, for some reason. Um, I, I don't know how it came up. I, I, I think my, my best recollection is that you uh, raised the idea to Mr. Friedman and Nick, or one or the other, or perhaps both, 
and that you guys had discussions about doing that. But you have no recollection. Why are you s making the assertion? What knowledge do you have? What proof do you have that I made the assertion of the FBI first? I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm testifying to the well, best of my recollection. Well, we're trying to prove something, so I'd like not to have a hearsay answer, and that way you, I'm asking you directly. Did Nick speak to you about the FBI? Sure. Objection. Uh, objection. Um, not that I recall. So, in the beginning, as you're <coughs> doing and researching a RICO charge, you don't have any understanding that Nick had come forward, even from the beginning, and said he's one of the few attorneys that can create a RICO complaint and, 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 and work with the FBI, as he'd done in the past. You have no knowledge of that representation of Mr. Alexander to me. Objection. Uh, objection. <coughs> I do not. You said you listened to the tape, and it's clearly on there, with a gentleman who has or had worked for the BBO is saying that you're performing malpractice. To me, it's not something you would forget. And then when you turn around in the next sentence of saying it's time to go to the federal authorities right now, regarding the Ponzi scheme and FRM, which is his was, piece was the banking, you would have had to use Mr. Freeman because you referenced that in your text messages. So in that same text, you have no memory of being accused of performing malpractice and having me the advice directly is to go to the federal authorities right away but you so you have no memory of that you have not looked at it the exhibits or his testimony that said that uh, objection. objection all right let me try to um, uh, respond to that um, I recall from mr. Friedman's testimony that I read that um, he had an issue or d disagreement with uh, I, I believe there was something about if a statute of limitations was, was violated then he would consider that malpractice I don't agree with that uh, I don't agree with his analysis of, of this case or, or, or handling well you're your guessing claims. what he meant sir, he sir, mean sir, he has not finished his answer he didn't mean that Okay. objection, objection. you assume yeah. that objection, objection. 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 So I take it you don't want to hear Mr. Renner's complete answer. Oh, yes, I do. Well, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Why don't we pose the next question then? No. So what we have here is that it's on the video that you see. Mr. Friedman saying that you were performing in Morris Mahoney and they got malpractice and I should go to the federal authorities. Okay, it's on the same. It's in the exhibit. You get to read it. And sitting on the BBO. But you do recall him saying going to Carmen Ortiz and that he lives on the same street. Do you recall, s it's in reference that you said that you recall that Mr. Friedman suggested that he lives on the same street? Objection. Isn't Objection. that so? Objection. Um, I recall that. I don't know if I, where I first heard that, either from you or from him. I, I recall that I, I heard that somewhere. Well. Mr. Friedman would be the only one who would know that. So Mr. Friedman said that. So now we have Mr. Friedman saying, Morris Mahoney, yourself, Nick Alexander committed malpractice. That I should go immediately to the federal authorities. And what you do acknowledge is she wants to he wants to include Carmen Ortiz of the U.S. Attorney. Would you say on the surface of that, that he's making some serious charges and pointing to some serious people to to make a case with objection 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 um were there serious accusations objection objection, objection. no malpractice is not serious well in the abstract a claim of malpractice uh, yes i would take that seriously would um, mr friedman suggest to go to the federal authorities without any reservations i have no idea I don't know his motivation for making those statements to you. Well, his motivation was that he thought you guys were committing malpractice, by, but for the reason <coughs> of representing conflicts, because when he said in an email that you have, it said that if I represented Mike Gill, 
I would be considering doing the same malpractice Morris Mahoney's committing because we both have conflicts. So Mr. Friedman was coming out and saying that you, that Morris Mahoney and Nick Alexander yourself had conflicts in the case. And that's the reason why you are committing malpractice. We're not reading into it. He said that very directly. Objection. Uh, Mr. Friedman, who you were working with, who you asked Mr. Friedman or his office to, 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 to sign on to the lawsuits, inferred to you that this was malpractice and we have the same problems Morris Mahoney has as that we have conflict. That's the reason Mr. Friedman got. Well, we have evidence that says exactly no. that in testimony. Not that I've seen Objection. it, sir. Okay. Objection. So you're also saying that, that you don't recall Nick Alexander leaving me a voicemail saying that, that, that he is one of the few attorneys that can open up a repo case with the FBI. You have no recollection of that? I don't recall right. that. Objection. Even though that, that was on the same video as you referred to hearing Mr. Friedman on. Objection. Objection. Uh, objection. I don't recall that. So the, so the piece that you would forget was the piece that, that, that your immediate supervisor left me a voice message on.